some basic facts about the boat. She was built in 1937 in Lorraine, Ohio. Set sail of farm near in 1938. Now after 40 years of service in the U.S. Steel Corporation, she was retired in 1978. Now she was retired because of old age or bad condition, just because she's too small. She's actually quite a baby. The ship itself is about 611 feet long. Then it's about 60 feet wide. That's a ship coming through because if it is, we're gonna get a nice little picture of it. But uh, continuing on with my spiel, continue on. You guys stay right there, just check if there's an actual ship. Oh, no, that's the vista. <laughs> but like I was saying, the ship, if we compare it to modern day vessels that might be going through the lift bridge, they're about a thousand feet long. So if you guys can imagine about a football field length in that direction. And they're about 105 feet wide, so if you imagine 40 more feet in that direction, as you can imagine, modern day vessels, a lot larger, a lot more cargo can carry. Now right now we're on our spar deck, which is our main deck right here. You're going to notice these boxes we have on top, we have 18 of these. These are our hatches, they down to our three cargo bays right below us. Now on top of the hatch, we have our hatch cover right here. Now it weighs about five and a half tons, held down by these dog ear clamps. Now this cover has a lot of weight to try to pick up the maneuver, so we have our handy dandy hatch crane back there. But we have our hatch crane right there to try to pick up these hatches. We just push them off to the side, and they finally start to load or unload our cargo right beneath us. Now the cargo capacity for the ship, about 14,000 tons and some change. That is a big number, probably doesn't mean much to you guys. But for a little visual, it's about 20 hundred adult sized elephants. Quite a lot of cargo that can be held on this ship. Do you guys have any questions before we continue to the back or the stern of the vessel? Size-wise, how does she compare to the Edmund Fitzgerald? You know, it's actually kind of nice because it's almost the exact same model as the Edmund Fitzgerald. Kind of similar, uh, you know, pilot house in the front, boat tech in the back. Uh, the Fitzgerald, I think, was around like 756. Please don't quote me. If this goes on YouTube, you know, you're going to have a lot of angry comments. Be like, hey, you got that wrong. No, I think the Fitzgerald's about 200 feet. Uh, more this way, and the, I knew it was about 95 feet wide, but you got about 26,000 tons compared to our 14,000 tons on this one, so it was a little bit larger. But imagine this pretty much is the exact same style the Edmund Fitzgerald had. It's always nice to have the same style boat. Any other questions? But this is the back of the stern of the vessel. That's right, here's our fan tail section. Just a couple things to mention while we're back here. Underneath this grating, we have our stern anchor. Now, it weighs about 6,000 pounds. As you guys can imagine, that has a lot of weight. So, all of our anchors are hooked up to our heavy duty chain links right here. This one's one foot in length. Each one weighs about 40 pounds. So, I'm done talking. Feel free to try to test your strength with these. Next, we have our tiller right here. This is hooked directly up to our rudder. Now, this is actually Now the reason this is exposed is for backup steering. Now let's say our hydraulic or electric steering never gave out. We have two electric winches in front of this boat deck here. We take those winch cables, run through the outside of the ship, then through the fixtures on the left and the right, attach them up to these two eye holes, 
and then yelling back and forth between those two operators, we'd be able to try to steer the ship. They tell us this is insanely difficult though, so this is more of a last resort situation. Then lastly, we have our spare tire right here. Now this is about one ton of solid bronze. The reason we keep a spare prop on board, each prop is specific to each boat. So it takes about two weeks for a new one to be manufactured and shipped back up to us, just in case we ever chip a blade on a reef. Or we didn't tighten down all the bolts cracked in the side here and it just fell off the bottom of the lake. Just in case we didn't hear that, we also have this yellow lead here. We 
inform the OMAP, Sarah's one something. Now I know that is a lot of information to have, but do you guys have any questions before we continue on to our crew report? See how they do. like a narrow hallway to us. This is actually the closest thing the crew had to a rec room or a living room. They would come out here and fold in chairs, read, talk, get a parents and shenanigans on each other. They would open up these two doors like they are now, try to get a nice cross breeze and those warm summer months. Now Lake Superior is actually sometimes a dangerous place for boats of this size. Uh, about 5,000 sunken vessels in this lake alone. Now one of the more famous ones you guys might have heard about, the Edmund Fitzgerald, we talked about it earlier. Now that sank in 1975. Sadly, 29 crew members that day. Now after the fit sank, safety started to become a big concern. They want to put some new regulations into play. And this is where they get our mandatory survival suit from. Now this is a neoprene if you guys want to come up and touch it. It's going to keep you afloat and dry for about three days. It came equipped with three things. A full bladder of drinking water, a whistle, as well as a high powered flashlight for you to flag down the Coast Guard when they got close. Now it takes about 30 seconds to put this on. As soon as you were zipped up, rush off the side of the ship, jump off. Try to get to a lifeboat they hopefully launched, or just try to get away from the vessel so you can get sucked down with it. Now, if you guys want to follow me this way, down this hallway, let's see where they lived and slept at. Rooms open up, so feel free to go inside and look around. We don't mind at all.
get back to the show. This right here is our galley section. That room we just walked through, that's our prep room. It's where our cooks prepared all the food. So that's where we're walking the fridge and freezer. Now this right here is our main galley. Now the ship is in operation. We have two professional cooks on board, as well as two porters or waiters. Took care of our crew exclusively. Now these two cooks, they took great pride in their food. They bought a ten dollars to $15,000 budget every season. You can imagine back in the 70s, that was a lot of money for food. Yeah. So our saves you got sirloin steak, prime rib, chicken, turkey, good homestead cooking. As many sides as you can imagine, they had dessert every night, so actually ate extremely well on this ship. But a couple things to mention about this room. You're going to notice all this beautiful stainless steel around us. Now we take this for granted nowadays, but back then, this is actually pretty much state of the art. Before this, you just have wood paneling up here, which meant lots of bacteria problems, as well as millions of stars on fire. Now, again, with the theme of state of the art, electric stove or electric oven, one of the very few ships at that time to have electricity up here in the galley. Now on top of the stove, we just have a little device called a fiddle. Now it's kind of self-explanatory, but it's just to keep pots and pans from sliding around too much and crashing on the floor, wasting our time to clean it up and having to restart. Now against this wall we have our hot table. This is fed with steam from the boilers down below. Now this is where our cooked our food they had just made for our sailors that might be on shift and cook them up during mealtime. Underneath that during my final shake here in our turkey. Always have two hot soups of choice. Excuse me. And in the center here, we have our uh, night refrigerator or a sailor's lunchbox. This is where our cooks with the food they had just made or leftovers, as well as smaller portion meals. This is where our crew could come in at any time of the day, dig into this, try to get a, you know, a small snack so they could continue on the day with a little food in their tummy. Let's continue on to the front of the bow of the ship. A little change of pace. Take a quick look at our crew's mess hall while we walk by. Does anyone say a guess at who ate here? Mm. Captain? Yeah. The Not cabin the captain, boy. A lot of the cabin oh. boy. <laughs> a lot of people say the captain, so you guys are in good company. Yes. Yep, the CEOs, our guests, our dignitaries, our VIPs. This is finally our guest quarters. Now, I'm actually going to have eight guests on board. When that happened, hired on one more professional cook as well as two more porters. That room we just walked through, smaller, more especially galley for our guests. Actually includes a wood burning stove. I mentioned in the stern there, our sailors got sirloin steak, prime rib, chicken, turkey, good home style cooking. Our guests, their menu was a little different. You know, they got flaming on, lobster, crab, oysters, mussels. Pretty much whatever they wanted and whatever they wanted. Now, it's actually a story about a woman who woke up one morning and she wanted blueberries on her pancake. Now, sadly, the urban was all out of blueberries. But thankfully, it was actually shipped close by to catch you come over and intercept with the urban. And this ship actually brought blueberries. So she actually had her blueberries on her pancake that exact same morning. Wow. So as you guys can imagine, these people were spoiled and pampered. They were wine and dine, trying to right? get their business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> trying to get their business for U.S. Steel Corp. or try to get the lobby for the company. Now a couple things to mention about this room: the clock is actually real, but it's broken. Just to answer your question. And this room right here is actually modeled after a luxurious railroad car that was built in the 1920s. Now all this wood paneling up here is actually original, original to this room. As well as this electric fan right here, it's actually from that railroad car, so a little touch of authenticity. But from here, we are going to travel over to our guest stateroom, so now they open up, so feel free to go inside to either room. We don't want you guys to explore a little bit, but try to stay on that first floor for me, okay? Now you guys have probably never seen, these are a little different than what we have in the stern of the boat, a little more spacious, a little more luxurious. State rooms. You guys are going to notice a couple of amenities around us. A full bathroom, including a full-size tub, 
quite a luxury on an ore ship. If you're also going to notice a telephone between both beds. That went down one deck below us to our portal rooms, essentially room service. Day or night, if our guests ever need anything, they could get it from our porters down below. You're also going to notice an electric fireplace. It was even electric all the way back then. You learn really quick, fire both of them right together. Yeah. <laughs> Now you guys probably noticed these rooms are pretty similar to the ones that we had down below. A little bit larger though. The bathrooms had a personal walk-in shower as well as a fanny for the wives. Now a nice thing about this level is all the mirrors in the bedrooms are actually tinted pink. Now that is because our guests, they were not accustomed to sea life at all, so they got seasick really quick. Get a green tint in their face or a pale white face. That pink tint will actually counteract it, make them look more flush, more healthy. A little morale booster, try to keep them happy, content around the urban. <laughs> Now outside this screen door we have their personal promenade or their outdoor balcony. This is just where they do their outdoor activities. They would sit out there in folding chairs, read, talk, drink, you know, chit chat. A couple of other things that she used to do, they would ride bikes up and down our spar deck. They would fly kites out there as well. They tried trap or ski shooting and even hit golf balls off our hatch covers into Lake Superior. So if you guys are looking for a free souvenir, there are really thousands of golf balls are out there somewhere. Well, it looks like we're done, so let's continue up one more level. Well, welcome up to our guest lounge, or essentially the party room. Don't get the dog. This is essentially our party room. A couple nice amenities about this room as well. If I can sneak this little closet right here. We got their first refrigerator, James Bond style. Now again, state of the art, this is electric. Before this, you just had ice boxes up here. And also came well stocked with plenty of healthy juices and notes for them to grow big and strong. <laughs> now our captain, he was sure to get our guests favorite drinks on board, so they'd be sure to enjoy themselves. Can we see the captain's office? Yes, just see. Now, underneath this counter is one of the more fun parts about this ship. There's a little button down here. It's made of ivory and slave with ice only. Now, if I press that, four decks below us, a buzzard's gonna go off in our porter's room. Now they're gonna have to get up. Go find a big bucket of ice, rush up here, and refill everyone's drinks with ice. First automatic ice dispenser. <laughs> Thank you guys, I appreciate yeah. that. It's that one lame joke I throw in. A little tea. That's good. Now our guests, usually on during late spring months as well as all of summer, the lakes were a lot more calm. It was also exceptionally warm up here as well. Now with all those other weeks we didn't have guests during our guest season or during those colder months. This would actually be converted to our captain's living room. Now this is where he could get away from the crew for a while. Do his business at the desk, maybe sit on the couch, listening to himself, get away. Now behind us we have two pictures. On the left or the port side, we're gonna have William A. Irvin, the namesake of the ship. Then on the right or the starboard side, we're gonna have a second wife, Gertrude. I'll we'll start with William. Now William actually has a quite a good story behind him. He had a drop out of school in the eighth grade because his father died, I started supporting his family. Now he started off as a telegraph operator in the railroad companies. From there, he worked his way in the steel industry. Now about a decade later, he became fourth resident of the U.S. Steel Corporation. Now he had to lead him through the Great Depression, but like I mentioned earlier, the company came out strong and prosperous. Then on the right, we just have a second wife, Gertrude. She is that strong woman behind every strong man. Now sadly, his first wife died during birthing complications, but she did have five kids, so the urban name still lives on. Uh, do you guys have any questions about our guest quarters that we just started, the guest stay aboard the ship? Well, let's continue on to our cabin's office. Walk through his quarters and continue up to our uh, pilot house up top, see where the magic happens. But, welcome up to our cabin's office. This is just where he did his secretary work, keep the logs, the record books, write checks for the crew when that time came. Now we have his communication system right here. We can reach every telephone from the urban from up here. We also have a gyro repeater, uh, just so you can keep it on the course of the boat while he's down here doing his business. Now you're going to notice on the calendar, December 15th of 1970, that is the last day the ship ever set sail on a U.S. Steel Corp flag. 
That was his last day of its last cargo. So it came through the lift bridge, dropped its cargo off in Duluth. Then it was towed over to Spear, Wisconsin, which was put in a scrapyard. Now, eight years later, in 1986, the city of Duluth wanted to come up and buy a ship for a museum. And they chose the William May Irving because of its history. And they used some, about four tugboats to bring it in this slip right here. And it's been here ever since. And then the last thing to mention, we have Captain Kidd, our last official captain. Uh, just like his last name represents, he was actually quite a little prankster, a little joker. Now, there's a fun story we like to tell about him taking the William A. Urban through the locks on the other side of Lake Superior. Now, he thought that day it would actually be quite fun to fly the Jolly Rogers flag or the Skull and Crossbones. But don't do that. The Coast Guard doesn't really have a sense of humor. So yeah, as soon as they got him in the locks, they boarded his ship, gave him a stern talking to. Then he actually got reprimanded by the company. But he's a good last captain to have. It's a fun story to tell. But let's walk through his quarters, then get you up to our pilot house up top. the most recognizable thing up here, the big wheel, the hydraulic wheel, or a teller motor. The kids can come up and turn this if they want to. Don't worry, it's pretty much indestructible. But make sure everyone gets a turn. No pun intended. Now this is what our crew would use when required finesse, like going through the bridge, for example, or a lock. Now back in the 50s, electric steering came on. Great advancement for the Irving. It has one of these gyro repeaters up on top, which are all connected to that massive gyro compass in that back room. Kind of looks like R2-D2. That kept true north for the ship. So if we come over and push this lever into the gyro position, where it is right now, it would engage these two, working in conjunction with each other, to keep the ship going in a straight line, essentially autopilot for the Irving. Very helpful when you're on the open waters and you're not changing course every hour or so. Well, let's say we lost electricity, maybe we lost our master gyro compass. We have to refer back to our binnacle, or our trusty magnetic compass. Now, the only problem in having a magnetic compass on an ore ship, for the 14,000 tons of magnetic ore, this is not very accurate. It's jumped around 5 to 7 degrees both ways if this wasn't calibrated correctly. So, try to refer back to our gyro repeaters, but sometimes we have to go back to the binnacle. We also have our bell right here. Every half an hour, that was rang in a different sequence. Lower time wasn't the cruise shift. Can we continue up on the lines? We have our captain's chat burn. If you guys run back in the engine room, that's our connecting end. Then we got our big whistle lever. Sally doesn't make any more noise. No more steam or boilers. Then we come to our two radar units. Very helpful during the day as well as the night. Because they have about 12 miles of visual sight across the Great Lakes because of the curvature of the Earth. So sometimes you can't see all the lands or the, the islands or the boats out there. So these really help with that. See about 40 miles of this one, about 60 miles of this one. Now over by that door, that green pillar right here, that stands for RDF. Now that is Radio Directing Finder. Now the days before GPS or Google Maps, this is how we figured out where we were. Back then, lighthouses would send out unique Morse codes specific to their lighthouse. Now if I could find three of those unique Morse codes, I'd be able to figure out our position, figure out where we were. Now, if you guys want to take turns in that back room, that is the charting room. It's where it's to chart all the courses throughout their season. Yeah, we got a question. <laughs> the wooden panels. I thought that was a joke. No, that was our actually. Uh, don't know your story from that. your starboard. What kind, no. what kind of right and left on the joke? No, back in the early 1900s, there was a big, big ship crash out here. And we'll call them ship A and ship B. 
So the guy who's manning ship A, the wheelsman, his captain said, please turn port. And he had a little, you know, brain fart. Turned starboard and said, crashed into ship B. And when they finally did the investigation, they figured out well, that's why the two ships crashed. They started making these mandatory in all Grey Lake vessels. And actually, all of our commands are given the left and right now, not port and starboard. <laughs> oh, okay. I know, right? It took all that nautical fun out of it. Any other questions? Is the Irving still actually floating, or is she pretty much beached? Uh, she's floating. She okay. has, uh, she's an eight feet in the water right now, and the slip's about 15 feet deep. They go up seven, six feet. No, there is a rumor. Okay, this is going around and kind of gets on my nerves. But there's a rumor that we have so much sediment in this slip right now that the Irving actually just sits on top of that. That's a lie. That rumor's not true. But she's actually still floating. And because we're still floating, we still have to uh, get haul inspections, and we have to be treated like a real ship. So I'm sorry, I can get away from these handy cables. Yeah, we're still a real ship, technically. Any other questions, though? You said that the uh, Irving McBride was uh, lynching the ghosts. Yes, I did. Now, uh, we actually have ghost people that come on board. We lock them in overnight. <laughs> and they've discovered three ghosts. Now, we have two confirmed deaths. One, during the construction, which we just fell off. Kind of explanatory, but um, the second one is Willie, and he was actually on the ship during the uh, one of his operation. It was behind that boiler door. Uh, one of the pipes burst it open, hot water got on him, passed away back there. And because of that horrific event, there's the uh, theory that he still haunts the ship. So we have a ghost that hangs up up here, and that we believe is one of the old captains. Hangs up here, a lot of weird sounds at night. And then we have one ghost in the cargo hold, so when we're putting together a haunted ship, you hear sounds, you see shadows that shouldn't be there. You have stuff thrown at you, like little nuts, space or stuff like that. Yeah. And then back in the boiler room, you just, it's eerie. It's cold all the time, it's freezing, and uh, it, just, it, it just, you feel like you're being watched. You're running like out in the woods at night, like you know, you just got that feeling. They're One here. Little, yeah, like I don't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's continue down in the cargo hold. The belly of the beast, let's continue on. You guys want to follow me? right here. Now this is how we used to get deckhands down the decks to tie up the ship and went to port. What we have is we have our young spry deckhand on top of hatch one. We would swing that wooden chair over to him. She would jump on it, white knuckle that rope, and kick him back off. Then we have our senior deckhand or a boss on the end of this rope. And then we just lower him down by hand. Now we might laugh and scoff at how this is done. This is actually still how it's done to today. Every lake right here still is one of these landing boots. We still use them. Oh she keeps coming back trying to find this is the best they have. But well, if you guys want to follow me down. Uh, no, this is actually just for the tourists. This uh, stairwell is not actually original. So when you get down at the bottom of the staircase, Take a quick look back and you're going to see a ladder right behind us. That's how you usually got down here. Now, welcome Stairs. to Cargo Hold 1. Let's talk about the hall. Now the hall is done in a double hall design, meaning there's an inner shell and an outer shell. So that is actually not the outside of the ship. Oh, hold on, sweetie. That is not the outside of the ship. We have around 12 feet before we reach that outside. Now that 12 feet leaves room for our ballast tanks. We have nine ballast tanks on each side of the ship. Those are our tanks that fill with water or empty out to make the ship more stable when we're loading or unloading. But let's continue on to say they load and unload these vessels. Oh, so, yeah, real quick. This is not standardized equipment. Completely forgot to address this. This is for a haunted ship in the month of October. So if you guys are in the Jennifer City of Duluth around that time, definitely come back for this. But try to imagine this is about the size of a hockey rink with like 30 foot ceilings. So it's more of like a cavern. 
You can close your eyes and back. Be careful out of it. 